Sahara Bhavatu, Sahara Bhunatu, Sahaviryam Karavavai, Tejasvi Navati Tamas Timavid Vishavai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti, may Brahman protect us. May he guide us and give us strength and right understanding. May love and harmony be with us all. Peace, peace, peace. <clears throat> what are we reading tonight, Swami? We're reading the states of existence from the complete works of Swami Abhedananda, one of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, who spent uh, about two decades lecturing uh, on the east coast of the United States. Uh, and uh, so gave a tremendous number of lectures, was a very popular speaker. And so we've been reading some of his lectures, and the one we're ta uh, starting with tonight is called The States of Existence. And Swami, do you remember the caterpillar in Alice in Wonderland? Yes. What he said to her, who are you? <laughs> yes, who are you? I'm Swami Atva Vidyananda, <laughs> and this is... You'll have to help me with this. Oh, uh, <laughs> is this multiple choice? But that's <laughs> <laughs> would be you. my first guess. <laughs> All right, do you want me to start? Oh, please. All right. That's probably got enough light. The whole life depends upon our individuality, which is no other than the true or absolute reality. And our personality is like the apparent reality. The individuality is our true self. When we think of ourselves and see things around us, we always have this feeling that we exist and the things around us ex also exist. When we see a chair, the chair seems to be in a definite place, and we have the feeling that it exists. The chair is not only a piece of wood, but it is bent in its shape and there is a feeling of an existence of the chair. Now, what do we mean by that existence? What is the real existence of the chair, or of the flower, or of anything that we see with our eyes? What is the real existence of a sound which we hear with our ears? All these things are like different conditions of the existence. Sorry, would you read another paragraph? Sure. Now, if we analyze our perception of the chair, we shall find that the chair exists so long as there is the name and the form of the chair. Take away the name and the form of the chair, it will turn into a common wood. Take away the name of the form, the, the name and the form of the wood, there will remain nothing but the atoms and the molecules. Take away the names and forms of the atoms and the molecules, there will remain what has produced the atoms and the molecules. So you see that which has produced the atoms and the molecules exists just in the same way as the chair exists, but apparently they are two different things. I sort of enjoy a running commentary on mm -hmm. these things, you know. Swami Bhedananda, one of the 16 direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. And incidentally, we've been doing this for a while. We started off reading the nine volumes of Swami Vivekananda. How long did that take us on Friday night? I think it was about 15 years to get through those <laughs> nine <laughs> volumes. <laughs> and then we started reading one at a time the other disciples, many of them now. So can you imagine Swami Vivekananda standing in a circle with his 15 brothers around Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna, I think, is what we can call safely a superluminary, of which there have been several, I think, commonly acknowledged or widely acknowledged mm. in the history of the world. There was Rama and Krishna. Shiva, would you be able to speak just a little louder? And Jesus and Buddha, Buddha first, and Sri Ramakrishna who were God-saturated men. Uh, this is fairly easy to evaluate, each person for herself and himself. 
And uh, I like to think of them as being like a, a thousand watt light bulb, if you will. I've seen old light bulbs, clear glass, big things, you know, Edison or something. And in a bulb of light like that, you don't even see the glass. You just see the light shining. So Sri Ramakrishna is acknowledged by many to have been one of these. And oh yes, oh yes, India, which has seen cycles of history, they don't have a linear view of history like the Native Americans, all circles. They've seen these saturated God-men come before, and they always come in the companionship of a feminine side, if you will, which also, who also was completely illumined. So you have Rama and Sita and Krishna, now, the missionaries come to India. Are we ready to handle this? Uh, and the Indians immediately honor Christ as a superluminary. Our founding Swami used to say, it's very interesting, with these superluminaries, it really doesn't matter what you think of them as. Hmm, Indian view. Your own teacher, You'd better try to feel the spirit of God in that teacher. He's not just Sam Jones anymore. He's an emissary. He's a postman, if you will. No. He's delivering the mail. He's opening the door, an actual living human being, your teacher, your guru. So you'd better think of that man not just as a guy that used to have coffee and donuts down at the corner, you know, Starbucks. Now he is working for the postal, spiritual postal delivery service. You're looking for the Spirit of God. But with the superluminary, it doesn't matter. It's very difficult, but in this multifaceted world of interfaith, perhaps it's relaxing for some to say that with the superluminary, you can think of him as a spiritual man. You can think of him as a prophet. Some do. You can think of him as so shining with light, so aware of his oneness with God. You remember Jesus said, I and my Father are one, that you can't see the light bulb. But it doesn't matter according to your standpoint. So here we have 16 men standing around Sri Ramakrishna, all with a different angle of perception. And for some of us, I suggest my brother here and I, we've gotten tremendous breadth and dimension from that. So, Abedananda, 20 years in the United States. Uh, this is probably written or spoken or something around 1920, right, Charlie? The others were? I think so, yeah, I think it was about then. So, yeah, it's interesting to realize that that was just about the time that uh, Things like relativity and quantum mechanics were right. coming into view, uh, but uh, not necessarily understood. Uh, understood yet. I'm not sure and Rutherford, this fellow from New Zealand who was studying in London at the time, figured out what we have understood for some time as the structure of the atom, with a nucleus, and positive and negative ch parts and charges as well. So uh, here within I think a year or two, I don't know, Abedinon has picked up on that and is talking about atoms and molecules in a way that I don't think was even understood 10 years before. So he's really with it. So may I jump in mm -hmm. now and see what we got? Hey, you know, in the baseball comment, uh, programs, uh, they have the play-by-play -play yeah. <laughs> commentator telling about the life story of the baseball player. I think it's theological. Again, take a pop made of earth, or an ornament made of gold. When we think of a golden bracelet, this is fundamental to, Adva to Vedanta's understanding. It's an Advaita Vedanta's understanding, non-dual. When we think of a golden bracelet, we think of its name and form. But that is not as real as gold itself, because we can break the, the bracelet, but we cannot break the gold. When we break it, its form is gone, and consequently its name is gone too. But the reality that underlies the bracelet is the gold, and that gold will remain. So 
this is the analogy, the simile, or the metaphor, if you like, that says all is spirit with a capital S. And not only that, but how about this? There is only one infinite shining spirit. One shining infinity. And in one of the Upanishads, beautiful words, words to live by, really, to get drunk on. They speak about Brahman. He shining, all these shine. So in the same way, if we analyze the chair, we will find that what has produced the atoms and molecules of the chair is like the gold. The wood holds the same relation to the chair as the gold is in relation to the bracelet. When we understand this, we go down to the reality of all things. Don't you think he writes beautifully? Mm -hmm. Yes. We're a little bit, um, how can I say, we're getting introduced to a beta nut one of the grand 16 disciples. A wonderful drama, a wonderful entertainment, precisely because he stayed in the United States for 20 years, a formative years, evolution, all these big things hitting the West, as well as the entrance of Eastern spirituality, we like to think because Swami Vivekananda, the leader of the band, huh? Vivekananda, the lion-hearted man, oh boy, you know, he came in 1893 to Chicago, wowed him. Young man, watch all the gray beards go by at the lectures and oh my goodness, he said, they all have papers. I didn't prepare nothing. What am I going to do? Had butterflies inside, kept pushing himself to the end of the line. Got up and prompted as probably he'd be the first to say my mother, the divine mother, the, the, the God imminent within each of us. He said, sisters, and brothers of America. And they gave him a three minute standing ovation. And he opened the door to Eastern spirituality. So within uh, 20, 30 years time, we find a beta here and we're getting, to, we're getting to know him. I think he writes beautifully. All right, then he goes down and says that <clears throat> the chair outside of its name and form <clears throat> produced the feeling of existence in us. The chair itself. That's why, if you're interested, we do not call ourselves idealists. It's not a mentality. It's not an epistemology, a question of our observation of a thing that creates it. Nope. It's something deep within, deeper than the name and the form, and somehow the chair outside of its name and form produced the feeling of existence, and it's the flower. Hey, we've seen this on our walks. The flower outside of its name and form produced also a feeling of existence in us. So everybody, let's have some fun with that. Look at the tree. If you presuppose one little thing, and that is that the tree has a subjective side, has an inside, is it experiencing inside entity? Brahman in yet another form, you have a whole different feel about the tree. So everything he says that we perceive with our senses has a close connection with the existence. Wow. Okay. <clears throat> now this existence should be known, that, that is, it should be known what it is and whether it changes or not. If it is a fact that everything in this universe seems to change, but the feeling of existence does not, not change. As, for example, when the chair is destroyed, the feeling of existence would remain with other chairs and other things, and at the same time, it will remain uh, with the nameless and formless chair, which is wood. It will remain with the particles of the atoms and the molecules, or with that which produces the atoms and the molecules. So when we understand so clearly as to realize that existence is universal, we will be able to analyze everything of this universe and reduce it 
to its primordial state, which is the existence. And when that existence is universal, it cannot be more than one. And then it is the only existence. So, of course, that's Satchitananda. There you go. <laughs> uh, and he's just driving that point home. That now, what is Satchitananda? I just came to exist talk today. <laughs> existence, consciousness, and bliss. So he's we're going after that that first aspect, the existence aspect, showing that that uh, uh, idea about Brahman, Satchitananda, or the three positive things you can say about Brahman, uh, and so he's taking that particular viewpoint in this lecture and going and showing how that existence, Sat, is the uh, essence of the universe and that everything has, ex everything that we see is filled with existence and in that sense everything uh, has Brahman behind it. Give me another one. <laughs> the existence which is in the chair mm -hmm. is also in the table. Take away the name and the form of the table and take away the name and form of the chair. The existence of these two objects is the same. Similarly, we can connect that existence with a book, with a tree, with an animal, with our human body, and we will see that only the manifestation of the existence in, is in various names and forms. So we come to the point of, come to the point of one existence in reality, which appears through different names and forms. That is the whole condition of this phenomenal world. The whole universe, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the planets, and all that exist on this earth, and all that we perceive with our senses, have that one source of existence, plus their individual names and forms, which are produced by the combinations of the atoms and the molecules and the different forces of nature. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I really feel that we've heard some profound mm. As a matter of fact, these few introductory paragraphs of this chapter in one of his, how many volumes in the complete works of the Vedanta? Do you remember offhand? Uh, about? Twelve, I think. Yeah, mm. I think it's twelve, and nine for Vivekananda, whatever the size of To try to absorb this, I would say has been the work of a lifetime, mm. who am I to say, I don't know, of our beloved Swami Sarva Priyananda, mm. who has taken the high road. You take the high road and I'll take the low road. <laughs> you take the low road. So the thing is, he is so sold on this idea that there is one existence that he wants to know about it directly. Just one Swami among many. But guess what he did? I think I heard this from his own lips. So the question is, did I hear correctly and am I remembering? I think he said very closely to this, that at one time he went where the monks gather in, in more northerly part of India, you know, Rishikesh, Hardwar. And they've been laying down their sleeping bags and blankets there for hundreds and hundreds of years. And at night, when another monk from another order would be nearby and would go to sleep with chickens, get up with the chickens, daytime, you know, sun up to sundown, that's why those two hours are so important to the meditators. And meditation is the foundation of India, just as analysis is of the West. And when the Swami next to the monk would let go down and go to sleep, I think the Swami would have like maybe little votive lights in a semicircle in front of him. To me, everything is experiential. You know, this is a laboratory. For, when we get together, we, this is the laboratory religion. And behind, or he's sitting in front of these votive lights, sitting up reading the scriptures. Not reading the scriptures, devouring them, assimilating them, saying, if them, why not me? I too can follow this path up the mountain to the top of Everest, to the top of the world. And I was saying, if you see Moses telling below for me on the way up, 
and say that everything is one shining existence. Now, you know, the, these paragraphs that everything is gold, I mean, that's mm. a frequent uh, 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 metaphor that uh, Swami uses. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. We have ancestral tongues, don't we? We have Latin, we have Greek. They kind of evolved together like the chimpanzee and the, the human, you know. The, the Latin didn't come just exactly directly from Greek. It came mostly because eventually Rome conquered Greek and, and all their old uh, teachers, like Epictetus and so on, they made them teachers and so on. So they kind of evolved together. But Greek is, in our minds, a little earlier. We have Sanskrit. We have the great spiritual tongues, Hebrew. I wonder over and over again if the King James Version, the Elizabethan English, the, the apex of, 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 of uh, English Shakespeare style, if it's so glorious, imagine what the Hebrew was. So we farmers, you know, simple guys in the Western tradition, United States, we speak like the Chinese in one syllable word. It's called Anglo-Saxon English. And it comes from German. So there must be a grandfatherly tongue. When you get through all the issues of the eggs and the ox, there must be some grandfatherly resonance, sonority in the German. I think there is. Because there is, there was a man named Kant. And he never left the hometown. He was a, a, a man who meditated through his mind. And he said, you know, when you get right down to it, when you're looking at a chair, or you're looking at a bracelet, yeah, or a table, you can never get with your eyes to the thing in itself. Sounds pretty good in English, but imagine how it sounds in German. Mm. The Ding an sich. <laughs> you can never get to the Ding an sich. Amen. <laughs> No oh, more. Be serious. Oh, I'm serious. You can't get to that because it's the soul, it's the heart. And India says, yes, you can. Hmm. He says, you can never know it. Yeah. And he says, yes, you can. In meditation, you can cut the knots asunder of the known, the knower, the process of knowledge. Just cut that Gordian knot. And you can realize existence, as the Swami's talking about, infinity in existence, knowledge, bliss, mm -hmm. and you could recognize that you're one with it. I think you're one. And like Sridharana yeah, is very fond of using the term of the I amness. Mm -hmm. You know, meditate on the I amness of your being, your existence. He even says, My amness. <laughs> He's a man, Mountain Sonny. I'm skinny and tall, you know. I used to be one I could stand up really straight. And these man mountain swamis, it's like, you know, Danny DeVito and Arnold Schwarzenegger, the twins. I'm always like Danny DeVito. So here are these man, he's a big man. And when he talks about my amnes as an irreducible something that we feel inside ourselves, he means the Atman. Hmm. Hmm. Infinity within is the same as infinity without, or something like that. Atman and Brahman are one. Okay, brother, where, where it's your turn at bottom of page 559. 559. That means we, we may, may consider. consider. Mm -hmm. We may consider this existence as universal. Ah, this is all. This is this is hymn, hymnody. It's like a hymn, like the vast ocean. In this ocean of existence, the sun, the moon the stars and the planets are like so many waves or bubbles which are constantly rising and going down and that will give us an idea of the unity in the variety of phenomenal appearances now this is philosophy i think it's also poetry mm. but i like poetry mm. and it's very meaningful to me that vivekananda went to see ramakrishna big time this time he was on a mission for this reason, he was studying under a Scotsman, I think, in Calcutta, and the man's name was Hasty, Professor Hasty. And I kind of like to imagine, just for fun, you know, that it was like goodbye, Mr. Chips, the last day of class, let's imagine. And they'd been reading Wordsworth. Mm. 
And Vivek and Ananda, after everybody left, in my mind, just for fun, went up to Professor Hasty with his black gown over his shoulder, said, Professor, he said, I'm not here, what is it? He said, Professor, has anybody been experiencing these elevated states of being that we've been reading about in Wordsworth? Well, the words of Wordsworth, which I was permitted by Paul and Sue, you know, in England, when we went to Tintern Abbey, it's actually across the river in Wales, and Wordsworth, 20 miles from this crumbled down abbey now where we were, said these things, and they permitted me to say them out loud in Tintern Abbey. And I have felt a presence more deeply interfused in the round ocean, in the living air, and in the mind of man. And I'm convinced, you know, don't, I'm the kind of guy that says, don't confuse me with the, the facts, my mind's made up. I'm convinced, like a little bulldog on a trousers car, that those were the words that Vivek and Ronda heard. And he said, Professor Hasty, anybody having that kind of experience now? And Hasty looked right, directly at him, you know, for a moment, and said, I love you. That is one. His name is Sri Ramakrishna. He lives across the river, across the Ganges in Dakshineshwar. And then as Hasty is preparing to walk out the room with a fade out, you know, says, I love you. You go see him. Go see him. Go see him. So, but, uh, but this is just a I, 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 I like to Now we <laughs> now we understand the meaning of the appearance when this existence works within the limitations of time and space. It becomes an appearance of that existence. A chair exists in time and space. A table exists in time and space. A book exists in time and space, and everything in the universe also exists in time and space. So we shall have to understand that form means an extension in space and time, refers to its birth and death. The chair had its birth and death. When the carpenter formed a mental image of the chair, that was the beginning of the chair in the mental plane. Then afterwards, he projected his mental image outside on the materials of wood. And then he gave the shape of the chair. Then there happened to be the birth of the chair. Now everything that has birth must go through the changes of decay and everything, uh, and eventually everything must die. Our body had its birth and therefore it is subject to growth and gradually it will decay and die. So everything that is apparent is subject to change. Of course, the particles of the matter are constantly changing and moving. There is the vibration of motion in every particle of the matter, and we cannot see the same thing twice in the same way. We may think that we see the same sun, and the same sun rises day after day, but when we study the condition, conditions under which these phenomena are appearing, we will notice that constant change is going on everywhere, in everything. Our eyeballs are changing, our brain cells are changing, and the vibrations of ether are also changing. The sun itself is changing, and in some day or other, we will see the death or decay of the sun. Science also says that there are many dead suns in the spheres of the limitless sky. The present sun will die one day, and the future suns are in, make, in making in the nebula. In the midst of these changes, it apparently seems that there is nothing permanent. And we are also watching these constant changes. Thus, apparently, we delude ourselves by thinking that we see the same thing day after day. But really, we do not. We do not see the same face twice in the same way, because the face is changing constantly. 
We do not bathe twice in the same river, in the same river water, as the water of the river passes constantly. So everything in the universe is changing always, and we are also subject to growth and change all the time. Now, now isn't this one we're talking about something that is a whole of the angel of Yeah, and he, of course, he's referring to, uh, uh, without using the term yet, I don't know if you'll get to it, but Maya. Maya is uh, uh, space, time, and causation. And uh, so he's talking about how the things that are apparent are the things we see in Maya, and they're in space and time, and they're always changing. So. I think this is just, just marvelous. Now, you know, Vedanta is kind of like the genie in the bottle. And the genie, Indian medicine, secretly, has gotten out of the bottle. As we like to say on the farm or even in New York, the genie is out the bottle. And you're never going to get him back in. The same thing happened with Judaism long about 2,000 years ago or more. It was a national identity. It was a national religion. I love this sort of thing, because we're Westerners here, see? And we want to look at these things also from our point of view to see the wholeness of it. <clears throat> Mysticism is one thing. I love this St. Martin. You know, you're sitting under a copy of uh, Satya of the Shroud of Turin. Which, think of it as you will, a poem, a metaphor, a literal, photographic transfer. But devotees will feel that they see the image of the face of Jesus in that shop. And uh, so Jesus in Israel, his disciples all thought he was coming back in their lifetime. In Israel, said he's coming back. And he said to them, and these grand phrases, like epigrammatic, like the ones we're hearing tonight, he said for two things, I think they're beautiful. One is the field is the world. And the other is go and shine your light on the Gentiles. So this slightly heretical group of Jewish mystics, the boys, the disciples, are moving their way along the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea into the Greek thought world, which is now called the Roman Empire. And the waves of mysticism are crashing up on the rocks. And no less a luminary than Vivekananda said, speaking of those disciples, that uh, however many of them went into Europe, went into, into Europe and blew up the Roman Empire. Now again, we find that Eastern mysticism is crashing up on the shores of Western Greek analytical thinking. And as the Swami says, you've got a situation here in which, let's put it this way, suppose you've got three salt shakers all together in the middle of a table, and you start moving them out, away from each other, like a triangle. The relationships between them, the gravity, the space itself, is created secondarily to the entities. This is my understanding. In other words, space is created by things moving apart. Time is created by two things moving around each other. You have to have entities which seem to be plural in our mind in order to have space and time. This is where the West comes in and says, Amen to what we're hearing from the East tonight. It's a rather beautiful thing when you think about it that St. Augustine, who lived a long time ago and was very mystical in his view from the Neoplatonists of the Greeks in, in the Neo-Christianity. He it was that said before creation there was no space and time. This, this began, and this is an affirmation on the part of the Westerners. The one I like so much here that we just passed through is Heraclitus. Heraclitus by somebody like uh, Bertrand Russell feels that he was the first philosopher or metaphysician. There is a real possibility that all of the holistic ideas that Greek had in philosophy came from India. And I'm not speaking of the partisan. The fellow named Thomas McIlvaney, a wonderful guy, for 30 years he studied the interrelation between Greece and, Rome, uh, Greece and India. 
And he thought that maybe Greece contributed to uh, uh, Indian logic, syllogisms and things, and that these big metaphysical ideas of being with a capital B, metaphysics itself in Heraclitus came from India. You know what Heraclitus said? One of the things, he said, you cannot step in the same river twice. Mm -hmm. It's whole history. Okay, buddy, where are we? Would you like to That's take five, six, two, Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in the midst of all these changes, the only thing that does not change is the existence. And I'd like to cross out the, the the in my mind. But in the midst of all these changes, the only thing that does not change is existence. Try to understand it. I'm going to, I'm going to do it, so I'm going to tell me it's wrong. I'm going to get, take out the thing. We're correcting as we go in this pretty version, but it needs a little bit for you. Try to understand it. Now, there's a wonderful sentence for you. And if you try to sincerely understand it, you will know that this existence is the truth and is also the reality. So, I mean, the Vigilanda says a lot of things in different moods and modes. And one thing he says, and this twists a few people's wings, he says, science and truth are all the religion there is. The existence is called in Sanskrit, sat, S-A-T. That is, that which is in italics. It can never change. May appear through the name and the form, but in reality it is beyond time and space. Isn't this a hymn that the West and the East are singing together? Remember they say that at the beginning of the universe and the morning stars sang together. <laughs> it is unchangeable. It is the absolute capital A or absolute existence capital E. So, I've already described it as the ocean of reality, capital R, ocean of reality. It is the eternal substance, and in it everything exists. Out of it, everything comes, and everything goes back into it at the time of dissolution, says the Upanishad. Upanishad's wisdom literature is the end of four big compendiums, if you will, of Indian scripture. Vedas, the end part, the end part of the Vedas, the wisdom section. So guess what Padanga means, huh? Hey, Swamiji said union brings joy. The scientists are working for it, the artists, and the fingers of the hand, the language family that we speak is called Indo-European. means we're all sitting around the lake, the Indian folks don't like this at all. Neither do the American Indians like the idea that the world started any place but their Kiva, their hole in the ground in New Mexico. You know, I mean, Western people think that we were all sitting around a lake once, probably somewhere in Russia, and some flew east, and some flew west, and some flew over the cuckoo's nest. Some went to India, some went to Persia, some went to Greece, to Rome, to America. And after all this time, they came back again, having had once a common language and saying, what did you find? What did you find? What did you find? It's kind of fascinating because the words are closely aligned. You know, we have El Camino Real right there, a bunch of like Highway 66, only with the Spanish king, the king's highway, El Camino Highway Real. And then India, the word for king is Raja. And in English, we have the word regal and royal. And in Spanish, they have the word real. So these people, they used to talk the same language. Now they have a very different way. They, I'm not sure they talk each other's language anymore. And what have you found? What have you found? It's a beautiful concept because we're finding that we really did have something in common. The Upanishads are called the end of the Vedas. Veda, uh -huh. in the ancient era, they kind of run around there, the echoes. 
In, in Latin, the Deo is I see. These are the insights of the, of the inspired soul, the illumined soul. That's what scripture is. Not that all the time the guy is writing, he's inspired. <laughs> Rabbi Krishna said the scriptures are a mixture of sand and sugar. But by golly, when he's writing the stuff that inspires our souls, he and she were inspired. They were illumined. So you get this thing in Latin, it's the deo, I see, beta. And in American, it means TV. Video, thanks to video, we all gotta reach each other tonight. This gets to be kind of like too much, it's over the top, we don't wanna sing, it's just beautiful. So, veda, we understand, we understand the veda part, then anta. That comes to the American ears, through the German, through the Anglo-Saxon. What does it mean? It means end. Of course it does. So it sounds like grandma, grandmother talking. Beta Anta. Hey, I'm sorry, he knows. You would have found out sooner in Kentucky Gold Men Cry. It's pretty sturdy. The end of the Vedas. The wisdom portion of all four Vedas, the Upanishad. But it means the same thing in Sanskrit tongue. As it means in English, it means the goal. We say about the Viva, the goal of the Vedas. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Give me that old time religion. Da -da -da. I mean, real old time religion. You heard about the born again Christian? Lord of us, isn't that wonderful? They go down to the altar in what is their moment the supreme moment of initiation. And the Baptists get so inside that they don't go. And they say they've experienced the inner light. Some of the Quakers talk about the inner light. The, the, the other Christians down there in the South, know, they talk about second birth. Born again, hallelujah. And then you got the Hindus, born again and again and again and again. And again. <laughs> but Vedanta means something totally without boundaries. The only oneness that is in Vedanta is the oneness of love, the oneness of unity. Not my way is the only way. Hmm. Not my way or the highway. Have I told you that the wisest man I ever met? You've got to feel that way back to Google if you don't. The man that founded this place in 1929, I know because I was founded in 1929. When I went to see this man who had had a very high level of inspiration, may I say illumination, he kind of liked to do everything. You know what he asked? He, who still don't know nothing. This is very private, this is heart to heart. He said, how do you think of God? Hmm? How do you think of God? In other words, he was going to form the Vedas like the potter's wheel, like God forms our body and our mind, whatever, according to the lights and the loves and the, and the goals, the intimation, the place on the mountain path. Of one of his disciples. And I may say with, with reason, the least of his disciples. That's the doctor. In the West, the scholastic method of teaching, which flourished until 1200 AD anyway, 1200s, is still alive in the schools, or junior high schools of LA. And what it says is, you don't know nothing. <clears throat> except what I in the book teach you. They've gotten that out of shape by 1,200 years into Western civilization. And so if you go into a Spanish class, the church teacher, you, you know Spanish? No, I don't know Spanish. Good, I will teach you. I'll take your head like a top of a coffee pot and I'll pour it in and see how much you take. We know thousands of words in Spanish because we got all these street signs, Los Angeles, 
I actually took a Spanish dictionary once and I put a little yellow dot or some kind of a dot next to every word that I knew for 30 pages and then multiplied the paper back in. I know 3,500 words in Spanish at least. <sighs> it's all inside of us. The Indians don't teach that way. Today, our lecturers in the, in the, high, in the colleges pretty much at least used to be that way. They will lecture and you'll take notes and then when the exam comes, you'll feed it all back to prove that you got the corn off the cob, you know, and then you forget it. I defy Harvard University to test anybody under that system within two years of the stuff that they pass for their senior exam. They won't do it. Or all the students be asking for their money back. Same with Columbia. Say, hey, that's the American method, the Western method, the analytical method. The Indian method is you, with humility, with a love that humility brings and vice versa to the feet, as it were, of your teacher. And you sit down and listen to these Indian swamis, and you ask him a question. Isn't that something? That's just a lot of fun. Swami, take over. I have no idea what we are. Such a about Can you see that? It can never change. Unchangeable. Absolute. I've already described it as the ocean of reality. Akati, I thought. It is the eternal substance, and it is the eternal substance, and in it everything exists. That's why we are much more nearly realists than idealists. We believe in a substance under the on ground of being. It is the eternal substance, and in it everything exists. Out of it everything comes, and everything goes back into it at the time of the solutions of the Upanishad, of scientific doctrine. It is called in Sanskrit Brahman. Brahman. Uh, in English, uh, proper nouns do not have a D. Brahman is the absolute reality as well as the absolute existence of the universe. Brahman is one without a second. Egam meva dvityam. You may think there are many things that dvi means dual, one and duality. You may think that there are many things, but the underlying current of existence permeates through the atoms and the molecules of every name and form of the thing which we perceive with our senses. This will give us an idea that the same existence which is in the sun is in the most remote stars, in the planets, in the nebulous mass and in everywhere. You know what Judy Collins said? We're stardust. And I believe it was also she that said, and we must go back to the garden. Now we can't go back to the garden. We have to go ahead to the garden. We have to realize an infinity of bliss, existence, knowledge, being, wisdom, and love, joy, greater than anything we ever knew in Eden. We've got to go to the end of the line, beyond even heaven, to the infinity of paradise. It's unbelievable. For instance, for instance, the electrons are the finer particles of matter. I think you missed a line. Okay. It draws its existence, you see, everything that we see. The whole universe is like a pain. Okay, there we go. The part that's so exciting to me is that, that there is a school of thought in India, there's another school of thought which is like the steady state, but there is this, which they're kind of reverse this other, even after he suggests that he sees some value in angle, but India traditionally saw that the universe comes out of Brahman in the manifestation and goes back in. More than we have time for that. Plotinus would say they're emanations of infinity, like the rays of the sun. Why would God want to pr produce anything? He's perfect. Uh, but for gain, for the play, he does this, and then takes it back in, like the spider, what I actually saw, a spider consuming its own web. 
you know, which comes out and goes back in, the cycle if you like. But anyway, that's the one that, uh, that I love, and it's in right here, remember. <clears throat> this will give us an idea that the same existence which is in the sun is in the most remote stars, in the planets, in the nebulous mass, and in everything we are stardust. There, the whole universe is like a painting upon the canvas of the eternal existence. It has no change, and anything that has taken a form exists. It draws its existence from that ocean of existence and appears as the individualized existent object. A lady was listening to Sarva Kriyananda one night, and then she asked me a question. What about the universe? What about the two worlds, or maybe the flowers or so? And you know what this grand Swami said, who I never heard put down anybody's point of view. He makes you feel one of them. He said, the universe is the epic poem of God. He. Mm. Yeah, he's our big nonverse. <laughs> okay, he says, then it dissolves again. It draws its existence from that ocean of existence, appears again as an individualized, existent object. Then it dissolves again and goes back to its primordial state. For instance, the electrons are the final particles, particles of matter. And when they come together by the force of attraction, they don't. <clears throat> they produce atoms, the atoms. That's quite uh, uh, opposite. Actually, <clears throat> the electrons flee from each other, and the protons do. The protons are positive, the electrons are negative, and they join. So basically, you've got that wrong, but that's all right. We'll have to figure that out. <clears throat> the atoms again produce the molecules. <laughs> and the molecules produce the elements of nature. And again, when the elements of nature come together, they produce everything that we perceive with our senses. Okay, so I think it's all yours. <laughs> Take us home. The food <clears throat> or any kind of vegetable product that we eat is nothing but the combination of the atoms and the molecules. We say that the potato exists and other vegetables exist. The meat exists, the particular dishes like soup or anything else exists, the fruit exists, the nuts exist, and all the existing things we put into our system also exist. Then we think that we have eaten and have a particular feeling that we have gratified our appetite and thus we feel satisfied and happy. Now what is happening inside? It happens so that it goes through a chemical change and in course of time this food stuff that has entered into our systems is transmuted into the blood and into different elements that make up our physical form. It produces the nervous energy and sustains our brain cells it has all been transmuted into these different things. It has gone through a radical change. Our body is also made up of these changes. Every time we are gathering from outside the new particles of matter and replenishing the waste matter that is thrown out of the system. So this continuous influx and efflux of the finer particles of matter make up our physical form. And that is just like an eddy in the ocean of ether. If we can imagine our body just like a whirlpool in the ocean of the ether, then that would be a good illustration. It is constantly revolving round and round, and it is moving and changing all the time with its position. That is going, uh, that is going on always in our system. But in every particle of this physical form, we will notice that there is the same existence which forms like a background and cannot be separated. It is closely related to everything, however minute the particle of matter is. In fact, this one ocean of existence is manifesting itself in these various forms, but the names and the forms, nama rupa, are not realities. If we want to find out the reality of the soul, or the reality of the universe, we have 
we will have to go to the source of existence, which is the universal or absolute existence. We will have to go to the source of the universal spirit, and there we will find some clue or something that is more substantial than mere thoughts. Everything that we say or utter in sounds or words, they all exist, and therefore that existence is the reality, and everything else is like a dream. Now, of course, we, we don't have the concept of ether anymore in the, in the physics, but there is this idea of an underlying field. Uh, there's an underlying quantum field and so you could replace that idea when he's using the word ether, which we wouldn't use in that way now, but a uh, hundred years ago, that was still used occasionally. This might intrigue you, but here, you know, we're pretty strong on science. Astrophysics, for example, the queen of the sciences. We actually call ourselves about to do the aquanauts. We're exploring inner space. But I think we, I think India will give us sort of all of this, some will, because it's not even a science of truth. We want to burrow through the mountain, making a tunnel, you know, like the Chinese from the West Coast to the Rocky Mountains and the Irish from wherever it was, Dublin, Missouri, the Intercontinental Railroad. We're burrowing a, a tunnel from opposite direction. So science is very important to us here. And uh, when the Swami is pointed out, that um, uh, you, you see, <laughs> you've got to start somewhere. You've got to start where you are. And I think that it's very important to us uh, to make sure that we understand in our languages, in the languages of science, that all of these things fit, fit together. So uh, if we want to find out the reality of the soul, we have to go to absolute existence. Uh, this is this is our way of getting there. Uh, so I mean, I'm just so inspired. And when you met, what did you just actually say? Do you remember about the very words you used? Or that sort of thing? Well, well, there's an underlying field. That's that, it. Yeah, that the uh, and everything is simply a a change in that underlying field. You know, all the the quantum changes in the universe are now thought of as uh, simply. Uh, like little whirlpools of energy or changes in this underlying quantum field. And they don't, they don't even talk about things anymore in, if you get down to the quantum physics. We, we have two ways of looking at the universe and trying to get them in focus. They are looked at both of the same, Einstein and quantum mechanics. The closer, the deeper, the deeper you get into the matter, going the small way in, one of the great contributors to quantum theory is a man named Erwin Schrodinger, and he spells his name with two little dots over the old S O E Schrodinger, yeah. In encyclopedias, yeah. He is called a Neo Vedantist. Swami Asheshan, on the mother's disciple, and actually only mother's disciple, the last Swami living, I believe, in the world that was in, that was in Oregon. And our Mike Morrow was there and heard him say from the pole one time, the scientists are our friends. The theologians are not our friends. The scientists are our friends. The scientists are working towards unity. The theologians still want to point out differences. That's what I think we want to do with our physics, our philosophy, our way of looking at the universe. Find out the similarities. It gives us a feeling that we're in the ball game that the bridge to the Indian mysticism is a two-way bridge. And that, yes, we from the West can also walk over that bridge into the land of, of experiential unity and mysticism. So, I mean, is that it? Have you and, got it? You know, in, in quantum interactions now, if you have two electrons going into some interaction uh, and two, uh, or two particles going into an interaction, two particles coming out, there's no this one and that one. There's just an inter interactions, and there's maybe changes in those interactions. And maybe simultaneously, even though the two electrons with the same spin are on opposite sides of the universe. I'm going to put a little letter, letter in his mailbox. I don't keep it deep. It's our secret. I'll put it in the night deposit. You'll get it in the morning. I wonder about these things. This is, you know, from ignorance, we get questions. 
So now there is no more a medium in Western science called the ether through which light can travel. Do you understand that when a wave hits the shore of the ocean, the molecules don't hit the shore, the molecules go up and down. Something called a wave hits the shore, just like the, the ocean, the rivers, that the molecules keep going. That's fascinating, right there. But energy, see, so anyhow, here's the problem. If you take away the medium, the water, how is a wave propagated through space. So light, we are told, is either seen, remember it's all in here, it's where we construct this stuff, the entertainment center, the red of the rose is in the back of your head. Therefore John Locke said, no king, no church leader has the right to tell you what to think. But the question in my mind is, are not waves and particles the same thing? The particles don't travel in water, the molecules, they go up and down but you have a wave and particles at the same time. So I'm going to ask the Swami if he can help me with that one in the morning. Yeah. Swami, what do you want to do now? Well, they're, ju they're just disturbances in the underlying field. Yes, yeah, so it's time for us to conclude. So we can uh, end with a chant. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamidachate Purnasya Purnamataya Purname Mahashishate Om Shanti 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 Filled with Brahman are the things we see. Filled with Brahman are the things we see not. From out of Brahman floweth all that is. From Brahman all, yet is it still the same. Om Peace, Peace. Peace.